listening to Resist and Restore, a podcast from the Circle of Hope Pastors where we're extending the table of our dialogue. I'm Johnny Rashid from North Philly. I'm Rachel Sensenig from South Philly. I'm Julie Hoke from Germantown. And I'm Ben White coming to you from South Jersey. Little curveball I threw you there. They didn't know I was going to announce my location, but I think it's a good thing to do. We're far flung, you know, and I, I'm, I'm really excited about this show. We're going to talk about what we're doing during this time. And then later on, we're going to interview all sorts of people about their experiences with COVID-19, a lot of essential workers and brilliant people. And then at the end of the show, we'll share some of the stuff that's nourishing our soul. How's that sound? My favorite section is spiritual show and tell, just for the record. I love hearing what y'all are doing at the end about what's nurturing your soul. I'm looking forward to that. So listen to the end, y'all. All the way to the end. Yes. But let's start out with the talk back section first. We are going to reflect here some of the many things that we hear throughout the week about what the church is doing and talking about. And I, I'm excited for this section because a friend asked me recently, isn't the church like dead now that you guys can't have big meetings together? And I was so happy to say, no way. <laughs> The church isn't meetings. You didn't dunk on them like that. You didn't just go all ham on them. No, no. I mean, I did. I I, I did admit that this is hard. We like meeting in person. We like hugging. We like being together face to face. But right now, the church is very much alive and very much doing things. So, so here's my question to you: what What has the church been doing in lockdown? I have this great story. that I wanted to just jump in and say right away, because one of the cells in my congregation, we have these cells that are groups of 10, which are kind of like perfect for COVID-19 pandemics, because we have, we're already organized in these kind of families, you know, these, these mutuality systems of about 10 people that are ready to take care of each other and make sure everyone's getting through this without too much hardship, at least certainly not too much loneliness, which is might be the, the biggest hardship of this for, for a lot of people. One of the people in their, their cell is a nurse, an essential worker out there on the front lines. And they ordered a sign, like a big yard sign that said, we love you, Jenny. And they put it in her yard. Nice. And like and there was like a goodie bag with like muffins and candy and That's stuff awesome. like that. I mean, it's just kind That's of over awesome. the top. I loved it. And they posted it on Facebook. I think it might have happened just yesterday when we were recording this, but it's so, it was so cool. It, it, and it came at such a great moment for Jenny. She shared on Facebook that she had just been feeling discouraged about, um, you know, people protesting about getting, you know, getting the economy going again and, you know, not appreciating what our essential workers are doing right now. So the cell really responded in a Holy Spirit kind of way. So good. My cell actually mobilized to buy someone in my cell a new computer because, you know, we're, we're meeting over Zoom or other platforms. And one person was just having a hard time because the connection was getting lost. The computer didn't have enough RAM or something to like keep up with the program. So people were like, uh, can we get you a new computer? <laughs> so yeah. That's awesome. Yep. It's just people are ready to respond to to one another's needs. Well, well, did someone say like, I'm buying you a computer, deal with it? Or was the person like, please give me no, a computer? No, 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 like, no, no. how they does didn't that happen? Ask. We were just like noticing the need ourselves. And then we were talking about how can we support each other? That's so great. And um, we, we, we were talking about this idea of mutuality, that we all have something to contribute that matters to one another. And sometimes it's like, I need an accountability person to like check in with me. Did I do this thing today? I've actually asked for that and I've gotten a text almost every day, somebody checking in with me. Anyway, so as we were talking about what we need and what we have to share, we just threw out this observation. Hey, it looks like your computer's having a hard time. Can we get you a new computer? <laughs> so Your computer so blows. Amazing. We're buying you a new one. <laughs> so if you need a new computer, you want to join Julie's <laughs> cell, I think is the takeaway here, okay? Should have just given out new computers. They'll probably buy another one, won't they, Julie? I think so, if it was needed. We've been noticing needs down here on South Broad Street. Um, We are part of the South Broad Street Neighbors Association because of our building down here. And these folks are really generous. I've been so happy to be part of them. This week, 
we were able to give money to several local organizations. Um, one of those is CMAC. They do creative things with kids all over the city, and my own kids have benefited from that. And today was awesome because we paid to deliver a, a bunch of pizzas to the emergency room at Methodist Hospital, and they were psyched about that there. Oh, awesome. How about you, Johnny? What What's the church been doing in lockdown? I was telling a few pastors just recently that this whole lockdown really teaches us what golden calves we have. You know what I mean when I say that? When uh, by, the time the, by the time Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, they had made another god to worship. Oh, that's and, a spicy biblical meatball right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but but when, when I think about the church, you know, what are the things that – what are the precious things that we hold on to that we can't let go of? And I, I think that crises like this really open us up to what those are. And, and one of them is baptism. People are baptizing each other or are planning on baptizing each other in the next week. Now, normally we do this outside. One of the – Rachel gets in the Wissahickon with somebody, dunks them three times. It's dramatic. It's freezing. It can happen in April. It can happen in October. Usually not January, but lots of times. The kingdom of God needs to move is what we thought. And so why don't we get roommates and housemates who have been baptized to baptize one another and then broadcast them at a live event? That's the idea. What prevents us from doing that? That's the question that we asked and that we came up with this answer. I love it because it really does flatten the whole leadership of the church down. Everyone can get involved in this. Everyone can have a taste of this sweetness and you don't need to be in a special class or have a special education or wear a mantle. Wear a mantle to do it. Yeah. Not a fireplace mantle, but like a cloak, which that's like a fancy a fancy term. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was wondering. Yes, you don't have to be clergy. This is the priesthood of all believers. and it. Yeah, we're all clergy. That's mm-hmm. right. It really reminds me of the, the earliest beginnings of the Anabaptist movement, where they, they were called Anabaptists um, because it means re-baptizers. They were baptizing each other. They paid a pretty high price for that, but I love how... We're reinventing it in our own moment. And I talked to two people who want to do it today. That's awesome. That's awesome. How exciting. Well, there's a lot of good things that are happening here, huh? Is there time for one? Is there time for one more, Rachel? I got I got another one. Yeah, one more. And I know we're only scratching the surface here, so we'll we'll keep talking. But go ahead, Ben. Well, yeah, they should probably tell us, everybody listening, um, you know, tell us what we're doing uh, and, and maybe what's going on in your church. You know, what the, the church isn't dead, right? E- email resist and restore podcast at circlehope.net to tell us a story about what God is doing in your community and in you. Finish us off. Yeah, Ben. Well, one thing we're doing at 3800 Marlton Pike in Pensacola, New Jersey, is we're actually renovating our our building. Uh, it's empty, and we're we're doing this like major renovation project. I got to give a shout out to Ryan Schmidt, who's a professional, like super high quality, in demand carpenter who is is leading the charge. But John and Sherry Laundress, shout out to them too. They're just making this so beautiful. We're doing this really cool thing, preparing for when we're allowed to be back in that building. We've got a bunch of square feet to be socially distanced in there and even work on projects separately, so it's totally safe. But it's totally awesome. Like, it's awesome. so it's so good what they're doing, and I can't wait for people to come and worship there. And uh, it's going to be so cool. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to our podcast. We're really excited that you're out there and that you want to connect with us. If you want to help people hear our podcast, there are two ways you can do that. You can share money with us. Go to circleofhope.net slash sharing. And you can go to the whole website to learn about our community. And you can also, wherever you listen to the podcast, give us a positive review. That's a good way for people to hear us and get to know us and and see what we're doing. We'd love to get more people involved, and that's a great way that you can do that. As always, on Sundays during this time at circlehope.net slash online meeting at 5 p.m., we have Sunday meetings and in, in time for worship, live chat and connection, and even breakout groups after. So you want to log on to circleofhope.net slash online meeting this Sunday to get a taste of that. And also, if you want to get involved in our cells, which are all online now, so wherever you are, you could probably make it happen, go to circleofhope.net slash cells. So, glad you're listening to us, glad you're talking to us. If you want to talk back, email resistandrestorepodcast at circleofhope.net
I'm really excited to share some of the stories that I've heard over the last few weeks with you. I spoke to people who have unique insights and experiences with COVID-19, and I want to share the conversations I had with you as well. It really is a testament to the kind of people we want to be in Circle of Hope, that we have these folks gathered among us. They want to change the world, they want to make it a better place, and they're willing to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. I want to start with what I learned about what it means to be an essential worker. Andrea is a social worker at Pathways to Housing, and she shares insight about what it means to care for a population that's largely ignored. I think that this is a time that we are being reminded that our decisions impact other people, and there are a lot of vulnerable people in our city. I hear people saying like, oh, I'm not sure if I should wear a mask because I don't really interact with that many people. I think it's important that we all like take part in it because um, you don't know who you could be affecting. What do you experience in your day to day life and in your work that you think we all need to know about? Something that's been on my heart a lot is people just having a lot of limited resources as far as their income. People don't want to get close to panhandlers these days because they're afraid of virus transmission. So people don't have as much money to maintain their habits. And it means that a lot of people are getting sick. A lot of people don't have means to stay healthy. In Center City, a lot of the restaurants and businesses where people would let them use the bathroom, like Starbucks, for example, actually lets a lot of people come in and use the bathroom, even if they're not customers, they're closed down. So they don't have places to go like that. I think that it's important that we be aware that people are suffering out there. And also in Kensington, the shelters that operate there have had to shut down from seven to four because of limited staffing. So people literally have nowhere to go. So in the <laughs> evening, 7 p.m. to 4 a.m., you're saying they're shut no, down? No, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., they're shut down. And so people during the daytime have to go out in the streets, which also makes it harder for me to contact them because I don't, I can't go to the shelter and find them. I have to go out in the street and look for them. So a big part of your job is looking for people and trying to find out where they are yeah. because they don't have permanent residences. And so they're just around town. Yeah. And I can't control when people come up to me. A lot of people recognize me in the neighborhood because I've been case manager for a lot of people. So people run up to me and um, I had someone like, their saliva got on my phone and like, I have to just step back from people. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really troubling because you already work with a stigmatized population and now there's this general condition that we're all in, this, this state of the world that we're in that really can exacerbate some of our own prejudices, right? Totally. Yep. What can we do to stay safe and stay healthy w without our prejudices being capitalized? I think remembering to, when you're out there, keep eye contact with people, smile, say how you doing, don't like completely ignore folks. And people have like different opinions about giving people money. I'm generally lax. And in this time, I've been giving out more money to people that I see on the street, just like some extra change or a dollar if you feel comfortable enough. But yeah, even just praying for those folks as you go by, I think they're a little bit more noticeable now because they're the ones who don't have a place to go during the day and a lot of other people are inside. You know, we're all God's beloved too. And each one of us, no matter what condition we're in, deserves to be taken care of, to be looked after. And it sounds to me like you're doing that for uh, who Jesus calls the least of these. I think there's something really important about giving people homes when they're being told that they need to stay at home. And Jesus is calling us and calling me into this work. It's not just about uh, job security for me. It's about offering resources and shelter for people who need it right now. And a lot of our people are severely immunocompromised. Yeah, I think Jesus cares a lot about the sick. 
my friend Bethany actually contracted COVID-19. And so she shared with me about her experience with getting the virus and recovering and what she plans to do with her newfound immunity. I started working from home on March 13th and I felt like a little tickle in my throat on the 15th. I chalked that up to paranoia about the illness and the virus. And a week into my symptoms, I was like, yeah, this is probably what this is, but there's still a chance that it's not. Mm -hmm. And it's just something else. I'm just, you know, sick with something else. The flu, I don't know. And I didn't really fully accept that that's probably what it was until I got my test results back. And are you at any point scared for your life? I was not scared. I will say that, um, like, I was experiencing a lot of anxiety before I got sick surrounding the coronavirus. I had been tracking the virus, and a couple weeks before I started working remotely, I canceled the trip to visit my brother in Thailand. Um, so I was already thinking about it a lot. It was really on my mind. And then once I started working from home, I just started experiencing just, like, anxiety constantly. And later that week when I was really sick and sleeping like 16 to 18 hours a day, I didn't have many feelings, many emotions uh, that I could think about when I was awake. But then as I started to come out of that and have a little bit more energy, I stopped feeling so scared about the future. I think my parents were more worried for me than I was. Although when I did start to get better was a little bit frightening just because of the reports of people starting to feel better and then having, I think what's called like a cytokine storm. So when the virus kind of like really reactivates itself in your body um, and you get a lot more sick. I eventually was able to get tested, um, which I know a lot of people are not able to and have not been able to, but about a week and a half or so after um, I tested positive, I had been speaking to doctors like every couple days, um, just updating my symptoms, um, and I got a call from a nurse on the team who helped take care of me from Jefferson Health, and uh, she told me that since I no longer had any COVID symptoms that I could consider myself recovered and I, I shouldn't be afraid of reinfection. Um, that they, you know, obviously this is a novel illness. It's new. So we don't know a ton about it yet, but it's looking likely from some studies that we'll have immunity for a while and it might depend on how sick you got. You got it. You're better. You're immune. How does that change your life? So I still spend most of my time at home. Um, I've been out of my house, I think, twice. I will say that my time at home is less stressful. I I do still sanitize things, but my home feels like a very safe place to be. And when I've been out, um, I've been grocery shopping. While being in a grocery store was definitely uncomfortable for me, um, just because of how strange it was, I... I wasn't afraid of getting sick, and I wasn't afraid of bringing my sickness home to someone else. So I kind of realized like how much privilege I have in that. Something that I'm doing to serve my community is volunteering my labor to go grocery shopping for people. It does seem kind of basic, I mean, and it's something that I could do in uh, had the world been normal too. But I think that because of my immunity being like a particular privilege and gift that it's a way that I can give back that not everyone can. I'm grateful that you're better. And I'm grateful that you're the kind of person that can imagine new possibilities, new ways to help people, even after um, recovering from such a uh, terrible disease. I'm hoping that, you know, donating plasma, grocery shopping, etc. will become more of a common practice as a kind of societal shift that's that's necessary in times like this. Iboro is a physician, and he shared with me about his experience day to day living with this virus and caring for people who have it. It's it's definitely been uh, a big adaptation for everyone involved. It's um, required um, a lot of flexibility among staff, whether it's at the level of trainee like myself or um, among administration. But uh, it's while it's been a mix of a mixed bag of emotions, it's been really encouraging to see, I guess, our 
medical community come together to try to be there for patients. Generally, we would be on rotations where we're, again, doing all types of different specialties, like gastroenterology or cardiology, which is of the heart, um, infectious disease, where now we are much more mobilized and trying to have a larger cohort of people that are focused on COVID teams, where we can uh, triage quickly patients from the ED who are we're concerned they're going to be positive um, because, you know, the main thing is that for these patients, uh, we want to protect them, but we also have to protect ourselves. And uh, I've learned a lot just logistics wise in terms of like what it's like to take care of a COVID patient, you know, having to think about where's the patient going to be at in terms of minimizing risk of exposure to healthcare workers. How often are we going to go in the room? Because there's always a certain amount of risk that and yeah, I think that's, yeah. that's the biggest change. Whereas beforehand, um, you know, there were, you know, there was, there was diseases that you had to be careful and thoughtful, of course, but now there's a, there's a level of intentionality now increased even more so in how we take care of our patients and also making sure that we're watching out for our colleagues. Absolutely. So how has your life changed at home? Do you feel okay? Do you feel safe? Do you feel worried about <laughs> yourself? I mean, you're, you're obviously exposed. And you come home, you have a kid, you have a wife, she's also working in this, presumably. And so, how clean is everything? <laughs> Probably not as clean as it should be. No, but, um, uh, well, first of all, I, I want to acknowledge this. it's a difficult conversation for any health family with someone who's a, a healthcare provider, whether you're a nurse, a doctor, or a respiratory therapist, or whatever you are on the front line. There's a conversation to be had as to like, Right. What is a risk for my child? What is a risk for what is a risk for my spouse? You know, and, and for us, you know, we it's just kind of again, our our own decision is not like uh, the standard of care per se. But we had thought that the risk of um, given our, our daughter was healthy, um, we had thought that uh, she was at a little bit less risk for having a bad outcome um, with COVID. And, and we thought that it was more important, especially given that we don't really have family here for us to stay together, because uh, some of you guys know. Um, the way our, our schedule ends up working out is sometimes like, it's like a, uh, you tag in, tag out. One person comes in, next person goes yeah, to yeah, their yeah. night shift and so forth. So was, we felt that it was really important to be able to, to be there and supporting each other. Um, uh, but recognizing, you know, at, at where we work, uh, for example, our, our hospital has made accommodation. So there are some families, uh, where a healthcare provider is staying in on a hotel room, um, for an extended period of time just because of the level of exposure to taking care of COVID patients. And there's, uh, I think that that decision is entirely reasonable, but it uh, it just shows everyone's having to make tough decisions and, and, and go with it. Annie is an OBGYN, and she talked with me about what this virus means for women who are expecting, and also how our society might look after all of this is said and done. There's a lot of education and also a lot of trying to calm fears, um, especially of pregnant women. You know, I, I think a lot of times this idea of pregnancy just increases the the stakes, right. um, I think, of getting infected. And that's not necessarily what the data is showing, that pregnant women are more at risk for getting COVID um, or for getting sicker with COVID. So they aren't more at risk. Not for contracting it. There's, there's some data, theoretically, the idea that their immune system is a little bit more compromised during pregnancy. Um, but they haven't found that preg pregnant women are getting infected at higher rates than other populations. Have you had to change any of your training? Do you have to do you ever do you, do you ever treat patients that have COVID nineteen or test them or work with them? Yeah, because I know that hospitals and I bet Cooper is one of them have a lot of cases and limited beds and resources and staff. Yeah. So as far as an OBGYN resident goes, you know we're pretty specialized and don't we do a little bit of critical care training during residency, um, but it's not a lot. Um, I'm definitely not comfortable taking care of a ventilated patient. I could do it with supervision. You know, like if, if I, we are part of the surge plan, eventually we're kind of last on the list because the problem is that labor and delivery is running as normal, right? Like it's the one part of the hospital that has to keep working like nothing's happening except a lot is happening. And so there's been a lot around that because in New York, they were finding that a lot of women were coming in um, asymptomatic, um, just in labor, otherwise healthy, delivering their babies, and then afterwards developing symptoms of COVID tested positive. And here, if you look back at their whole hospitalization, they had exposed like 
30 staff members in total for all of the people that they were in contact with. Um, so they, oh, wow. yeah. So they recognized that labor and delivery is like a really high risk exposure area. And thankfully at my hospital, we've, they've really taken that seriously and provided us with a lot of workarounds to kind of help keep us safe too. Um, we reconstructed part of the OR <laughs> of our operating room on labor and delivery. So if we have to do a C-section on a COVID positive patient, how we do that, if we have to intubate someone on labor and delivery and they're COVID positive, how we're doing those things. Um, and we're actually probably starting universal testing soon too, um, of all pregnant women coming in and being admitted for labor. Oh, um, wow. So yeah, it's, it's changing. It changes like every 48 hours. It feels like you get a new email with a new policy update or you're in a new meeting. Well, we were doing this this way last week. Now we're going to do it this way this week. And that, yeah, that because you're getting new way. research, new yeah. data all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just new levels of, you know, the number of COVID patients in the hospital. I have a lot of friends, you know, who have been pooled to work on those floors. Um, but in our department right now, um, we're not part of that because they need us to keep, keep labor and delivery running for right now. What should we be thinking about and praying about and acting upon? You know, we're talking to you because you have unique insight into this. What's the best thing we can do? I, you know, I, I think about when it's okay for me to see my family again, because I know this isn't from my standpoint, from my job, you know, I'm still going to be seeing COVID patients probably for the next six months, yeah, at least, you know, or a year. So it's like, so when when is it okay? When is when do we accept some of the risks of being in community with each other? Um, and so I ask myself that a lot. I think one of the things that people can can do to help that is like all of. The, I guess this is a hard a hard thing to to kind of talk about because I feel like sometimes I don't know. <laughs> Like I really don't, I really don't know what what else to do except kind of do one day at a time right now. But the social distancing and everything that we're doing now, um, I think it, it's it's helping. Um, and we're gonna, everybody's gonna be affected differently. I think different cities are gonna be affected. I don't, you know, not everyone's gonna turn into New York, and it's there's gonna be a lot of controversy about what was the right thing to do and what was you know not the right thing to do. I think I just want people to have hope that like there will be some like sense of, you know, socialization and regular medical care. I think hopefully our healthcare system is going to change dramatically after this. Um, we're already figuring that out, right? I mean, the fact that I can, you know, see all of these patients virtually and take care of them and order them the medications they need and, and just realizing like, oh, maybe we should get insurances to actually reimburse well for that because it's it's improving access to care and all those things. So on all the days that I have the fear and anxiety, I, I think I still am ending on hope for public health to the forefront of people realizing they have to like take care of their neighbor in this way or should take care of their neighbor in this way. And then also changing our healthcare system. Matt works for Pathways to Housing, and he shares with us how this virus particularly impacts people of color. I mean, one of the biggest things that we've seen ex an explosion of it within Philadelphia and beyond is, especially within the Black community, there are so many people, they are not offered as much access to health care that they end up with things like respiratory conditions or other health conditions that it is it has nothing to do with who they are uh, genetically, but it is the social determinants that impact them. And we see that all the time in our work. And it is just heinous that this particular virus is just shining a, a disastrous light in that way. And, uh, but then I think that that's also true when you bring in, um, substance use and, uh, you know, people who are, who are using these, uh, who are using substances, they are, they're still stuck and they don't have the access to the other supports that maybe either could make it safer for them or that they could access treatment or that they could get into hospital systems because they're told to stay away or to stay home or to uh, on and on. You you know, um, it's it's really frightening. I was feeling it myself where, you know, honestly, even right now, I am not even taking a full breath myself because 
I think that there's this unconscious feeling within me that the air itself holds threat. And I don't even have asthma. I don't have respiratory or pulmonary issues. I don't have COPD. These are very disproportionately represented within especially black communities and black communities here in Philadelphia too. And I think that we need to be calling that out. Josiah is an epidemiologist at Drexel. And he talked to me about why this isn't just an urban problem or a problem with urbanism or a problem with immigrants and why it affects vulnerable populations even more, how it showcases the inequalities that we have in our society. And finally, he shares what life might look like in a new normal on the other side of this. There's also this whole other facet of people's social environment in terms of inequities in society or race or uh, income. And what sort of neighborhood you live in can have a huge impact on your health, as I think it's, you know, pretty well understood at this point. And so it's not just the biology of, say, you breathe an air pollution molecule, but the people who are breathing high levels of air pollution, for example, are not uniformly distributed across the population, right? People with less advantage tend to have these higher exposures, we're generally in a densely populated area. What does that mean for us in terms of contraction and transmission of this virus? Yeah, I think that there's a common sense idea that density is related to more transmission, which makes sense. If you're walking down the sidewalk, it's more crowded. You're going to have more people sneeze on you. But individual behavior can really outweigh just the density, I think. And so you could have a lower, less dense area where People are not social distancing, and they could have much higher transmission. So right. it's not necessarily inevitable. It's a factor, but it's not necessarily the only driver. The first big clusters in New York were in the suburbs. In Philly, it was in Montgomery County in, in the suburbs. I think there are more people in the city, and so there's more people who get sick. But, you know, the New York Times just had this article this week about, is the day over for the largest American cities? And they talked about how, you know, is everybody going to want to leave cities now? And I think there are a lot of benefits to being in the city for health. There's this thing in my field called the Manhattan Effect, and people in Manhattan actually live longer than you would expect because they live in a dense environment. So, if people is that just to, about resources that have that they have access to? No, no, it's it's about having a walkable environment. It's mostly about using more physical activity in your every day, uh, not getting into cars. Oh and wow, so that's fascinating. If people leave the cities over this, I feel like that will be a a decision based out of their perceptions, not necessarily based on any science. Sometimes I hear people who have a certain political hobby horse try to make a point for it or, or make a case for it based on the current crisis. I think we also see this in terms of dialogue about immigration. You know, as far as I know, it is true that, that closing down borders helps prevent the transmission of this virus. But if you couple that fact with an anti-immigration ideology, you might get a really bad cocktail there. Sure, absolutely. And, and it goes both ways, right? You could also be blind to the basic science of, you know, I don't know, there's his higher air pollution in dense areas, for example, right? But right. Um, I think both sides use it. And usually the answer is always it depends. How much information do we actually have about how many people have it in Philadelphia? It's very, very likely that the number of true cases is much higher than the number that we have confirmed. I think that's the common opinion. I think there's lots of young people and probably lots of kids walking around who have it and might be asymptomatic and are spreading it. And it seems with Philly, maybe we're, you know, coming close to the peak of the curve, so to say. But we just have to wait and see. But I think that, especially earlier on, a colleague of mine did some analyses of that and found that almost all of the testing are much higher rates of testing within the wealthier neighborhoods in Philadelphia. And there are some reasons you might justify that, okay, maybe those people were traveling more, at least earlier on. But that's pretty much held um, even now into the more recent month where there's much higher rates of testing in the wealthier areas of the cities. And that could be down to uh, health insurance in the poor neighborhoods, you're going to have lower access to health insurance. I think earlier on, and maybe even now, we know from other health outcomes that there's bias in the medical establishment where they're less likely to take complaints seriously if they're coming from people of color. They're more likely to say, oh, just go home, wait and see, don't worry about it. Whereas oh, wow, that's terrible. 
Yeah, where if it's a white patient, they're more likely to prescribe a medication or give them painkillers. It's like they trust what they're saying more about what's going on with their body, whereas with people of color, there's um, a little bit more of a lack of recognition for what they're saying. It would be completely plausible that people would be less likely to seek medical care if medical establishment has less rapport within certain communities, has, has earned less less trust. And, you know, but that ties in also with the health insurance issue. If you don't have health insurance, you're going to some sort of public clinic, you know that the lines are going to be long, you might not be, you know, receive as attentive attention as if you're sitting one on one with your private doctor in some wealthier neighborhood who really wants to listen to everything you have to say. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel here? Is there any optimism about what our society could look like now that we know the deadly costs of lack of public health infrastructure and care. I feel kind of personally, not necessarily in my professional role, but that we're sort of riding this line right now between fear and unity. Even when I go out and I, I go for a jog or something in my neighborhood, it's like people can't decide whether they're happy to see me, happy to see another human, or whether they're afraid of me. And I, the answer is both. And I think that it's hard to know what's going to happen politically with our sense of public health. On the one hand, you could have an embrace of, you know, universal health care or rebuilding the public health system, which has been kind of dismantled by capitalism and privatization. Or you could have the wealthy even more desperate to cling on to power and not see much change. I think I am sure optimistic in a way that the public health system um, will receive a little bit more attention and funding. I feel like Something like this pandemic is the sort of thing that public health folks are always talking about and waving the flag about. And, the you know, as time goes on from the most recent pandemic, the politicians and the public cares less and less, and they don't think it's really real. So because we've been in our homes for six, seven weeks now, people seem to be losing some patience for it and getting a little antsy, and they think, now it's time to get out. But but really, we, we it, it could cause a big problem if we break social distancing protocols now. Everybody who hasn't had it yet is still vulnerable to it, is still naive to it, as we say, still has potential to be infected by it. And so until we have a vaccine, we're also vulnerable. Just because the cases are going down now doesn't really, you're never going to completely eliminate the virus from society, like, you know, smallpox or something, at least not in the next couple of years. And so it's always going to be this underlying threat. And so in, I'm sympathetic to, I mean, 22 million people have filed for unemployment in the last three, four weeks. I mean, that's, that's devastating. And I'm sympathetic, of course, to, to people who need to get their lives going again. But from a public health perspective, from just the perspective of the virus, we're not ready to do that. And in the U.S., what we need is more testing, right? So if you have large testing um, capacity, you can test large percentage of the population. You can really monitor where cases are popping up, and then you can quarantine those cases before they're, they're able to spread to, you know, to people around them. I think what we'll see is slow reopening of certain sectors with maybe some trial and error about what increases cases and what doesn't. So commerce will start to come back a little bit. It's kind of a dance is of bringing it back. I think large sporting events, unfortunately, there's they're just it's just not worth it. <laughs> the enormous amount of risk for going to a Phillies game with, I don't know, 40,000 people, however many people in the stadium. Schools depends how good the team is, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but schools is tough. You know, everybody's drained with that. And the, 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 the most recent evidence says that children really less ability to transmit it than we thought. So if that evidence keeps building in that direction, maybe schools will actually be one of the things that we feel is safe to open, even if other things are still closed. Josiah also wanted me to mention that Sherelle Barber is someone who you should be listening to. Her Twitter handle is at health equity doc. Go find Sherelle Barber if you want to hear more insight into these subjects. I'm grateful that we had these conversations. I'm grateful that we're connected to each other. And I hope that this invites you more into our community because we want to hear your stories too. And we want to hear how you are responding and coping with and dealing with this virus and this, in this difficult time. 
you might have more insight to share. So email us at resist and restore podcast at circle of hope.net. Okay, this last segment is spiritual show and tell. We like to share things that are nourishing our souls, hopefully, uh, so that can nourish your soul too. Who wants to get us started? I'm excited because the NFL draft is this weekend and I need some sports in my life. Baseball's canceled, hockey's canceled. I don't even like hockey and I'm upset it's canceled. Basketball, (laughs) but the NFL prevails. And even if they play in front of empty stadiums, there's still a chance that the Eagles will win. And every time the Eagles win, it nourishes my soul. To be fair, every time they lose, it destroys my soul. So we're going for as many wins as we can. I'm just excited that a symbol of normal life is expressing itself. And I'm thrilled about the prospect. So the NFL is actually going to happen? I didn't hear this. So far it is. You know, the NFL is a big operation and pandemics may not stop it. It could be totally irresponsible. Capitalist entertainment must continue. Bread and I know, circus. I'm a hypocrite. Everyone's a hypocrite. I watched the whole football thing, but, you know, I hope they do it safely. There's a chance they won't. It's a concussion-style sport, so who knows what they're going to do. But nevertheless, I'm excited, and it definitely nourishes my soul. Just because you're a sports fan, or is there some is there some like pastor answer there too? I love the camaraderie. I love being part of the tribe. If someone says "fly Eagles, fly," you could be in Portland, you could be in Denver. You see a member of your tribe, you yell across the freeway or wherever you are. It's fun, man. It's it's we're connected. We're blood. You know this. We bleed green. We say. <laughs> You know, so, I mean, I, I don't think I gave you a pastor answer. I think I gave you, like, why this is idolatry to me. But there's something in that, you know. Uh, there's something about the, the human connection, the familial connection, that I think actually expresses itself in the church, to be honest with you. But it's also fun to be with people um, in the, it, with a common, common shared experience like that, really. So, yeah, it's, it's, it really is great for me. Johnny, as as critical as I am of the system, I can appreciate that, especially as a South Philly person. Um, you know, we're down here by the stadiums, and it just is part of life to feel that camaraderie. So I'm with you, too. Go birds, baby. <laughs> Go birds. Yes. Um, my cells, my I I'm, get to be part of two cells right now, and they have really been nur- – the camaraderie there has been nourishing my soul. Um, something especially cool happened during Holy Week um, in, in um, my cell that is mostly temple students. Um, but we were asking each other – it was the day where we talk about anointing when Mary anointed Jesus for burial, and we, we were – kind of spontaneously asking each other, well, how, how can we do that? Like, what can we do for God this week? And we landed on some answers that just involved, like, expressing our gifts as who we are. And my friend Becca said, you know what, I'm a dancer, and I need to just do that, That's even awesome. though nobody's watching. And she ended up um, doing like a sign language dance. She recorded it and performed it on Easter and shared it with me. And it, it just brought me to tears, realizing that like what we do matters. Like even right now, even though our lives feel more hidden in a lot of ways, we can still express our gifts to God and each other. Um, and it makes a difference. So I want to hang on to that. Yo, is Becca the kind of person that we can share her dance with uh, our friends on the Resist and Restore podcast show notes? Uh, I think so. I'm going to ask her to share it with us. We'll see. I hope so. I want to see that. I guess I'll go next. Uh, my spiritual show and tell is Kittatinny Ridge in the Pocono Mountains, right, right, right on the edge of uh, New Jersey. There's this long mountain. I think that's what Kittatinny means, actually, is long mountain. And and at the top of it is Mount Tammany, uh, which has this breathtaking overlook of like this like glacier scarred cliffs where the where the Delaware River snakes through in this dramatic kind of bend. And it's so beautiful. And especially when you get to the top of it, you can see everything. And my favorite thing is to get to the top of Mount Tammany and look down on the hawks and vultures. You know, I'm in New Jersey, like right now. And you see them? Yes. You can see them below you. 
I wait until I see a bird flying underneath me and then I go. You know, that's my that's my ritual. Um, and uh, here in here in uh, Philadelphia and South Jersey, I think we're at about elevation 18. <laughs> you know, like we're barely above sea level, very flat place. Um, so to get up even to some old worn down mountains like the Poconos makes me feel very nourished. But here's the thing. I didn't get to the top of Mount Tammany when I was up in the Poconos last week for my kids spring break. Um, my parents have a place up there, so I was able to, to be isolated in another house. And we and but the national park system is also, uh, you know, observing lots of closures for safety. And Mount Tammany is a pretty popular trail, so they closed it. And I, if I were going to get to the top of Mount Tammany, I would have had to hike the from the bottom of the Kittatinny Ridge essentially all the way up, which is which is impossible to do with a six year old <laughs> who was one of my companions. But I still made it uh, up a few, you know, probably. I don't know how many hundreds of feet above the the valley I got, but we went up the Appalachian Trail, and we uh, we were we were looking down. I didn't see any birds below me, but we were high up. And when when I get up there, uh, as strange and kind of um, maybe even prehistoric as it as it sounds, I feel closer to God when I'm up, up there up high. Uh, even though even though God isn't up, um, getting up. Uh, is an, is a, is a transcendent experience for me. Nice. Your pictures were beautiful too. Um, so last week on our daily prayer water blog, the writer was using a poet and theologian, Padraig, uh, Padraig Otuma. I never even heard of him before. He's a, an Irish writer. And, um, I was really appreciating um, those entries and his writing in, in our blog. And then my friend sent me this, um, interview from On Being, uh, with Padre Gotuma. And he is actually reading Leanne O'Sullivan's poem, which, uh, was a, a poem in gratitude for healthcare workers, which I felt like was so timely, um, in this moment. And I loved listening to him talk about the poem. He, um, he was recognizing the woman's name in the poem is, uh, Fanula. And he talks about just saying the names, um, noticing the names of people who are serving in the midst of this crisis. And I went throughout the week, uh, noticing, you know, the utility workers, the grocery clerks, the gas station attend or not attendants, but people inside, um, just thinking about all the people who are still working that make, keep life going in the midst of our shelter in place, um, wondering about their names, thinking about who they are, feeling gratitude for that. And, and uh, you know, as Johnny interviewed all, all of the folks among us who are doing that work, they, they face almost impossible jobs with graciousness and fortitude and patience um, that it, it, uh, it was just nourishing my soul to pay attention to who they are this week and, and to feel gratitude for the work that they're doing and the, the love that they demonstrate being trustable people who are still going out there doing what needs to be done. Jewel, your story reminds me of the song that Becca signed to, um, did so a sign language to that made me weep. And it was, I know that my Redeemer lives. And in her silent uh, expression of that through this dance, it just, it, it, it's, I, I feel like it speaks to all the people who are out there taking risks to love right now um, in a difficult time. But they're, they're evidence that our Redeemer yes. lives. Yes, indeed. Thanks so much for listening. It's great to have you out there, and I hope that you can keep connecting with us. Again, email us if you want to talk to us, Resist and Restore Podcast at circleofhope.net. And please review and subscribe to our podcast and share it with people that you think would be blessed by it too. See you next time. Yeah.